experience the most efficient system for delivering sulfur and phosphate to meet your crop's needs with Smart Nutrition MAP plus MST. Joining me now is Kristen Thompson. She's the Interim Extension Coordinator with the BCRC, which is, of course, the Beef Cattle Research Council. Welcome here, Kristen. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. So it is uh, tis the season, whether we want it to be or not, uh, where many of us are staring down the barrel of maybe some cooler weather, starting that winter feed schedule. And that, of course, brings us back to the importance of feed testing. So maybe let's start there. Why is it so important to have a plan for feed testing for your herd? Great way to start. Um, whether you are a cow-calf producer, have background in cattle, own a feedlot, understanding the nutritional qualities of the forage that you're feeding is paramount to maintaining animal health, welfare, and productivity. So feed testing, it not only allows you to develop appropriate rations that are going to meet the needs of your livestock based on their stage of production or class, it's also going to help you identify any nutritional gaps that may require further supplementation, such as nutritional deficiencies. It can help to prevent or identify any potential problems due to mycotoxins, nitrates, that kind of thing. It allows producers to economize feed use and make use of alternative feeds safely, as well as accurately price feed for buying and selling so that you can price that feed on a dollars per nutrient basis. Mm. So uh, really, I mean, hitting the big ones there, but thank you for bringing up because I forgot about that one too. Um, certainly looking at really trying to head off any disasters as far as mycotoxin loads, or as you mentioned, nitrates, those sorts of things. Um, and then of course, it, it does bring up that, that question of supplementing with energy or protein, whichever one may be lacking, knowing ahead of time. In my mind, I always think about with livestock, it's cheaper to keep them in good condition than it is to try and catch up on nutrition. You are very correct on that. It's It takes a lot more energy, protein, a lot more feed, a lot more cost in order to bring that body condition score back up for those cows, mm -hmm. for sure. Okay. Now, it does bring up the question, we've got, you know, round bales, wrapped hay, uh, we've got square bales, we've got maybe bags of, of silage. What's our approach or what should be our approach for each of those? Maybe I'll start with when we're talking about round bales, they're, the direction at which I take a sample matters. So walk us through round bales first, and then I've got a couple questions about uh, silage as well. Okay. Um, to start off on sampling, um, the f I just want to kind of highlight the first step before you're even taking that sample. The first step that you want to take is to separate those forages into lots based on not could be based on a number of factors but the reason to do that is to allow for the most accurate estimate of the nutrient content of that forage so these lots could be based on forage maturity they could be based on variety harvest date uh, they could be a single cutting or a single field um, but the idea is to separate them based on the expected forage quality differences. So as, just as a quick example, if you've got an alfalfa stand and you get a first and second cut, keep those two cuts separate, sample them separately, test them separately so that you know what you're dealing with. Because there will be some quality differences between a first and second cut. Um, so moving on to sampling. Um, a... Forage or a feed test is only as good as the sample that you submitted for testing. Very important to remember. And so you need to be sampling at the right time, using the right tools and techniques, and collecting the right number of samples. When it comes to dry baled forage, a forage probe is recommended um, rather than taking hand grab samples because hand grab samples uh, are more likely to contain a disproportionate levels of leaf to stem, right? You want to get a good leaf to stem ratio. On those, the forage probes should be 12 to 18 inches in length, about 3 eighths to 3 quarter inches in diameter. Um, and they can be designed as a hand crank. So you're using your own power to drive that probe into the bale. It can be a lot of work. 
um, or they can be attached to a, a cordless drill, which makes it a, a lot easier. So when you're using that forage probe, you want it inserted into the end of a square bale, whether it's a large square bale or a small square bale. You want to insert it into the end of it. You want to insert it between the twines um, and insert that probe all the way into that bale, pull it out, dump that, um, that core into a usually a one quart zip bag, kind of heavy duty one you want to use so you don't get any puncturing of the plastic. And then seal that up for sample for testing. When it comes to a round bale, you want to sample from the curved side of the bale. So and the reason that we're sampling from the end of a square bale and the curved side of a round bale is that you're going through those layers um, of forage so that you're getting the best leaf to stem ratio to be most representative of what that forage is going to be like. Right. And so it is, yeah, so one is from the end and one is from the rounded side. But really, if you think about it, it's so that the probe passes through several of those layers, whether they're round or flat to get exactly. sort of a little chunk of each of them. Um, now, I will I will say from experience, use the drill, everybody. I don't know. Nobody needs a feats of strength trying to do the hand crank. Um, use the drill if you can. Uh, that makes it a lot easier. Now, and great point about the different lots, about, you know, whether it's first cut, second cut, maybe it's a different field, maybe it's, right, we've got to have a representative sample of what we're actually trying to test. My question then becomes, I've got some wrapped feed. Um, I know certainly many uh, farmers that would have a bunk or a bag of silage. I would imagine that those are ones that I want to test when I open them. That, of course, makes me a little bit worried about turnaround time. So what's a good strategy for opening up something that's been ensiled and testing and getting those results back in a timely fashion? So when it comes to silage that's in a, a bunk or a pit or a bag, you can actually sample those as they're going, as they're being harvested and before they're covered and sealed and ensiled. Um, and that can give you a, the benefit of sampling at harvest is that it gives you an advanced knowledge of the quality of that forage going into the pit which can give producers time to inventory and plan for feed purchasing based on that forage quality. So if you've got forage going in that's really low in protein, lower than you expected, you've got time to plan and purchase. Now, if the silage has been packed and sealed properly and normal fermentation has occurred, you're, you shouldn't be seeing a significant change in the nutrient profile, particularly when you're looking at the fiber and protein fractions. Um, that being said, when you open up that pit or that bag, you want to do another sample just to verify that the fermentation has taken place appropriately and there's no significant changes in that nutritional quality and then make adjustments appropriately. When you are sampling, you want to allow yourself a minimum of two weeks between when you take the sample and when you should expect the results to come back from the lab. You know, give yourself maybe three weeks just to be on the safe side because you want to make sure that you've got that result back before, you're, uh, before you've got to feed that out. But just as a note on that with silage, another good thing about having the sample results from harvest is that when you open up a new bag of silage, the first portion of that silage is not going to be representative of what else is in the bag. So you actually want to feed out a small portion first and then take a sample so that it's more representative of what you're feeding for the next, you know, two to three months out of that bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense, right? You would likely have, if you're going to have pockets of spoilage, et cetera, those sorts of things likely going to happen sort of right at that front. So work your way in a little bit and get a better sense of, of what it actually is. Um, okay, so that's I really good to know sort of, um, or it's a good tip of looking ahead to where you may be able to head off an issue before that bag even gets opened. Um, this all, though, does come down to, even if I've got a two-week turnaround, uh, let's say I have been very vigilant and got my feed tests and I have them in hand, what do I do with them? Or who can help me with them? Because I will say I've, I'm getting better at reading feed tests, but I think a lot of people, uh, we look at them and we sort of have a couple numbers that we're dealing with. Um, but who can help me 
uh, actually go through what I get back on those results to actually start to put together a balanced ration or, or to meet the goals that I have for the livestock I'm feeding? Good question. And this is, it can be confusing. And when you look at all those numbers on a feed test, you know, which ones do I focus on? Do I use dry matter? Do I use as fed? Um, it's, it's a lot to take in. Um, my recommendation would be for producers to reach out to their local extension specialists or nutritionists if they do have questions. Uh, these experts are a really great resource on reading the feed test um, providing pointers on how to use that feed and also balancing uh, rations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm based in Saskatchewan. So in Saskatchewan, we have a, uh, we have our Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture has uh, regional offices located around the province. Um, and they're a really good resource for these types of questions. Now, not all provinces have that um, have those regional offices, but there are typically um, extension offices um, around the province that can help out. Um, there's also ration balancing software programs such as CowBytes, which is available through the BCRC at beefresearch.ca slash CowBytes. And it's a really user-friendly, easy to use tool for producers to balance their own rations so they can take their water tests, their feed tests, and put those numbers in and then choose their class of cattle, stage of production, environmental conditions, et cetera, and balance a ration that will appropriately use that feed based on the feed test. Okay. Now, uh, so good advice there certainly is, you know, reaching out to local extension or your, your specialists or, or perhaps a nutritionist as well. Um, and, and you mentioned water. So I know we're talking about, you know, forage and feed testing here, but how critical is it to also test a water source when considering uh, putting together a ration? It is very critical, especially if you are dealing with poor quality water. Like if you're in an area or a region that's got historically poor quality water, testing that can be very critical. And it will have it will have a significant impact on the nutrients that are available within that ration for the cattle. Um, because if you've got high sulfates in your water, that's going to bind up copper in your ration. So you might need to supplement extra copper, have a more bioavailable, bioavailable um, type of copper that's in your ration. So there are a lot of things to consider with water quality. Definitely very important. Okay. Um, good advice there. I certainly, I personally know people who have uh, had sort of a mystery on their hands with feeding and it turned out to be exactly as you said, um, sulfates in the water that were making other things unavailable in the ration. So it's not always something we think about uh, when we're thinking about, you know, minerals or supplementation, et cetera. So uh, really key and, uh, and thank you for that. All right, Krista, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, thank you so much. Again, that's uh, beefresearch.ca is uh, the BCRC. Uh, Kristen is in Interim Extension Coordinator. Thanks so much for joining me today, Kristen. Yeah, no problem. That was great. Thank you. Yeah.